gives me great pleasure to introduce Darren Strauss to authors at Google today. Uh, I met Darren in 1980 at the prepubescent age of nine years old. Uh, we met at camps Oxford and Guilford in Guilford, New York, which is up in the Catskills. Um, and Oxford Guilford was a sports camp, and Darren and I were the least athletic people at the camp, still to this day. Darren could often be found playing guitar and reading books, and I was typically taking photographs. Uh, but that did not stymie our love for camp. Uh, we spent the next 11 summers together as campers, as counselors, and then as camp directors. We then moved to Aspen, Colorado together in 1992, which was the result of a pact we had made in the 1980s that we wanted to ski a winter together. We spent basically a year and a half in Aspen, Colorado. I got a job working at the Aspen Times in sales, and then Darren later landed a gig uh, writing editorial, or writing, I guess, nothing, pretty much, according to Darren. So uh, since that, da that time, Darren's been pretty busy honing his skills. Let me read you some of his credentials. Uh, Darren is the author of the international bestseller, Chang and Ang, uh, and the New York Times notable book, The Real McCoy, one of the New York Public Library's 25 books to remember in 2002. His work has been translated into 14 languages, which we like at Google, obviously. Um, and he teaches writing at New York University, and he actually won an award there for the Outstanding Dozen Teaching Award. Darren's also a screenwriter, um, is translating Chang and Ang for, uh, for the film, for the big screen, um, and he's working on that screenplay with actor Gary Oldman. Um, and Darren was awarded a 2006 Guggenheim Fellowship in Fiction Writing. This week, it's this week the book comes out? This week, today, Darren's third book comes out called More Than It Hurts You. I finished it on, finished it on the plane last night flying from uh, Colorado to New York, and it's undoubtedly his best work, and I think also potentially his most disturbing. Um, Darren lives in Brooklyn, New York with his wife and his recently born identical twin boys. Please welcome Darren Strauss. So, um, uh, can't find my stuff. So I, uh, I have a couple of um, options here. Um, I was going to leave it up to you guys what I read. I was going to either um, read from, I'm doing a blog on Google, I mean on Google, on Newsweek, about um, my book tour which is kind of light and fun, or I could read from my book. And um, if I read from the book, I was going to ask people to come up as volunteers <clears throat> to read with me because um, I think readings are often kind of boring, but if I have someone like playing the male lead and someone playing the female lead, it makes it kind of fun. So um, what do you guys think? Anyone want to uh, volunteer to be a husband and wife? You it doesn't have to be gender specific. The, a man can be the woman. Okay, great. Great. So, you're gonna read from here, and I've got a mic for you. So here's your mic, and your name is Adam. I'm Darren. Yeah, pleasure. And you are. Jen, this is yours. This it is your... appropriate because I hired Adam. Oh, really? <laughs> does, does that mean that his job is in jeopardy? No, he's in. He's in? Okay, good. Um, so I'll just read the... Um, this is just the beginning of the book, so I'll just... I'll be the narrator. And uh, Adam is going to play someone named Josh. And Jen is going to play someone named Dory. And we'll just start. It's the beginning of the book. It's called More Than It Hurts You. Oh, I'm supposed to use this, right? Okay. Fifteen minutes before happiness left him, Josh Golden led the summer intern by her elbow to share in the hallelujah of a Friday afternoon. Work was petering out across the sales department. The butter smell off somebody's microwave popcorn settled on the cubicles and even teased the far offices. The first hint of weekend and eloquent in its way. Quit screwing around on the net. You're missing some fun in the coffee room. That's the coffee talking. But that summer intern with her frown like shark gills at the corner of her mouth, Alyssa, Trisha, lacked what Josh believed we're all made for, to know when to work hard and when to stop. You don't think you can outrun the long arm of the weekend, do you? Josh said. 
He got familiar with people right away. He had that puppy quality of never being a stranger to anyone. Trisha, Alyssa, people in general, went along with him. He acted cheerfully and blessed, and it's hard to believe that what happened happened. The weekend. Oh, no, sorry, you're only reading the... the you're, <laughs> You're the wife. This is, uh, oh, oh. This is a different Sorry. person. So different, we're in the office girl. now. <laughs> I'll be playing the part of everybody else. <laughs> the weekend, but it's still Friday, Trisha Alyssa said, laughing, smiling. In other words, unlike herself. She was a mumbler whose temperament was a kind of infirmity. You know, work, said Josh, squeezing her elbow lightly. Isn't only for work. They were walking really close. Josh moved quickly. Each long stride was effortless. Trisha Alyssa could barely keep up, her heart gasping for circulation. Yet she felt the usual pleasure, looking Josh in the face, his dimples, the constant wattage of his smile, his air of couldn't be better. Very few people met life with a face that free of grievance. Of course, it helped to be very handsome. Well, all righty then, Trisha Alyssa said. Her little laugh came as two hard breaths out her nostrils. I never thought of it in that way, Mr. Golden. Like many women feeling the first cool drafts of spinsterhood, Trisha Alyssa worried about bad breath. She'd forsworn coffee, and so the coffee room, since she'd begun working at Sparkplug TV. Let me understand something. You haven't been on break the entire week? Josh said. That's downright un-American. This was Josh's specialty, teasing and feather touches. He never upset you at all. Well, Mr. Golden, I'm really an Arab. Can't you tell? No doubt. She had goose pimples now, every little hair in her arm standing up. At the same time, despite the warm nudity of, her, of the boss's hand on her elbow, she found herself more relaxed than she'd been this whole first week at Sparkplug TV. That's the power of genuine attentiveness for you. The key was the long tenure of that touch, the hand babying her elbow. I'm just kidding about being, you know, Arab, she said. Yeah, sure. Keep ululating, Mohammed. His normal smile was a pleasant, subtle mocking. But for tough cases like Alicia Trisha, his laughing eyes, out of courtesy, took on an added, nearly female gentleness. His curved black lashes touched at the corners. Josh had enough social generosity to create his music, even for someone so dreary. She didn't pull her hair across her mouth now. She didn't stammer just because this handsome man was making talk with her. Josh had been aware of instigating this sort of quick evolution before. They stepped into the coffee room at the height of somebody's repartee. Paul Damphouse, a young sales exec, bald too soon, was recapping a Saturday Night Live skit about the president. Office humor in a nutshell. Impersonations of impersonations. For his size, Damp House had a large head. For his sins, he had an ulcer. You bastards microwaving popcorn without me? Josh said. He, with an athlete's liveliness, he hurried in. A smallish lounge was all, three men and one woman in it, everyone idling near a surprisingly crappy sofa. These people were assistants or planners, miles beneath Josh in the topography of office status. Shit, it's the boss. Hide the premium blends, said Doug Moscow. He was a young guy glittering with the importance of an intern recently made assistant. I'm not the boss, Josh said. Just your boss. Moscow ticked his head back, a breezy what's up, at which point Alyssa Trisha's throat shut like a chimney flue. Hello, she managed. The light from overhead fluorescence quivered. It jangled the nerves and gave everyone the appearance of being photocopied where they stood. Josh gave Trisha Alyssa a distinct nudge of a look. But she just hovered there, frumped out in a polyester skirt suit, skirt suit. She was prim as Popeye's olive oil, with the same shapeless Frankfurter torso, in the uncomfortable quiet, the only sound of the latte machine's revolving door-like whoosh. Trisha Alyssa decided just to keep smiling, but once a smile becomes a decision, it's no longer a smile. Small talk abhors a vacuum. The other guy here, Mark Santella, started chatting about his teenage daughters. Somehow a conversation got pieced together. Our kids, they're crazier than we were. Well, you were probably never that crazy. Yeah, and what were you, some kind of goddamn? Santella and Damp House crunched through a faux argument. Dude, you totally rock out for, what are you, 80? Well, you haven't been shit-faced since I'm guessing junior prom. And Josh, flaunting his charm and celebrity smile, raising a Clooney eyebrow, quickly ended it. Hate to say this, but I've seen both you guys pass out from one beer. He was a married man with a baby, and he recently seemed removed by half a degree from any childness he may have, childishness he may have joined in. The coffee room was Josh's forte. He felt comfortable everywhere, this airtime salesman who was the reverse of the old joke. He had no acquaintances and many friends. But he could really open up his charms here, where your schedule lobbed you a mock day off a couple times a day. Late Friday afternoons were the best, of course, the week already throttling down, relaxing into quoted movie lines, ribbing, more open flirting, and the anticipation of home. This newly refurbished lounge had been done up with an imitation school penance, 
Spark Pug Spirit 07, an exhausted sofa, scuffed Led Zepp stickers on the fridge, a perfectly balanced stalemate of Yankees and Mets paraphernalia, an injury retardant Nerf dartboard, never used, some 1970s vintage posters of Lee Majors, but somehow all these theatrically dirtbag touches sort of didn't add up to anything. Prior to Spark Plug TV's new regime, the coffee room had been merely drab and impersonal. Now it was impersonal, personal, drab, and wacky. The residue of counterfeit wackiness having been the dot-com culture's dying gift to legit businesses. Still, the lounge was alive. Who wouldn't want to hang out in the only break room? Or at any rate, it seemed warmed a little by the joking that had accumulated there. In fact, Josh probably felt more at home here than at home. No one nagged him here. People understood that a sales dinner wasn't all fun. It was work, too. Josh took the first scalding cup of his coffee. He didn't join the conversation at first, but by giving confiding looks all around, he lent his unspoken clout to the break and was happy. He grabbed a few snacks from a styrofoam cup without registering what kind of food it was. He, noticed, he alone noticed some kind of fuss out in the reception area. His secretary, Demita Melendez, phone on her ear, was tensed. She gasped, blinked a lot. Whatever she was hearing had her ripped. Boyfriend dump her again? Family problem? Josh leaned forward to peek. Demita put her hand to her very emotional face. Her light brown cheeks had gained in color like steeping tea. And now she was headed to the break room, to Josh. Meanwhile, by the latte machine, a tweezered young woman named Kate Wilbur, owner of the shapeliest eyebrows in the company, was talking. Some dude she knew recently got a big MTV Networks gig. He'd been a buyer at PhD before jumping to the sales side for a buttload of money. MTV paid great. But the guy totally had carb face, so who cared? As Kate said this, as Kate said this her shrug said, all single men have carb face, at least the ones I meet. Josh realized that the snack he was eating was fruit skittles. Josh's secretary, Demita Melendez, had reached the break room. Josh tried his paternal face, a squint of experience, because what is a boss but a nine-to-five father? Right away, however, he felt there was some reversal. Uh, Mr. Golden, she said. She fidgeted her body and stared dumbly with a hot face. Dory left a message. It's Zach, she said. Something terrible happened to Zach. Dread hung on her. He's, uh... Dory was Josh's wife, Zach, his one-year-old son. It's one of those human quirks, but the first reports of horrifying news often cause a kind of giddiness. Josh gave a little laugh, which he'd remember with disgust for the rest of his life. What? What? Demita only said, Zach is, and then she let out a noise streaked with tears. In the sudden pressure drop, Josh said, Zach is what? It seemed he were watching a movie, but the dialogue and the lips weren't quite synced. He missed her answer. Everybody else looked at one another uneasily, furtively. Everyone but Josh had the passing thought or instinct. Does this affect me? Am I all right? Which got replaced at once by the relief that somehow or other, Josh must be at fault here. It's a shame that his son might die because he's really nice, at least in the face of things he is, that maybe he's a bad parent or person unlike me. All this in half a second. Oh God, Kate Ernster said, with a promiscuous woman's special reverence for family. Those brows of hers were really impressive, angling up like peaks on graph paper. Oh, my God, she said. Demita was talking now. The words doctor, intensive care, lost consciousness, blood. But then she stopped herself. She felt terrible. Probably she should have gotten Josh alone to tell him. I never do anything right, she thought. Josh, as if he'd fallen from one movie into another, found himself outside, running. He held his car keys. When had he gotten them? The office buildings he ran by were geometrically simple and ugly in the tipped-over refrigerator style. What had Demita said exactly? Josh was now at the door to his Lexus. No, no, the baby couldn't have stopped breathing. The car's black roof was sequined with raindrops. Had it rained? What Josh became aware of next was the flap of the windshield wipers, that metronome. Okay, he was driving along the service road. It was raining again. He was conscious of that. Intensive care? Lost consciousness? He thought, and then he let the associations drop there. The word he didn't confront devastated him. It was like something heavy and leaning behind a door that he didn't want to open. And yet, in what was this ongoing movie, he still didn't feel the words full power. His life was coming as if through a sieve. Coma? Josh thought. That was the word. He got slammed by a fist of panic and almost lost the wheel of the car. In the days when she'd worked, Dory had been a blood taker, a phlebotomist. After the second Austin Powers came out, Josh called her his phlembot. Whatever was happening, she must have things under control. That was one benefit of having married into medicine. Just calm down here. Josh wriggled his cell phone out of his pocket and dialed. Hi, you've reached Dory's phone. Voicemail. A fierce betrayal that recorded hello. So cheerful, as if the news hadn't reached every shadow of her. Josh realized his car radio was on. WFAN's 2020 sports update. 
Derek Jeter had rolled an ankle and would have to go on the DL. This stole Josh's concentration. Shit, right in the midseason? Oh, sorry, that's you. Immediately there was a firmer, canceling voice in his head. Forget Jeter. What's wrong with you? But maybe by being, maybe being distractible through a crisis is another way we protect ourselves, the body guarding against terror as against infection. And then Josh's brain left the road again. He looked into the window of memory, a neat square cut into years. Right after the baby had come out, wrinkled head, scrunched E.T. face, Dr. Feldkamp had asked whether Josh wanted to hold his son. This had been right there in the delivery room, all, with all that blood and the thick salt smells. So he carefully rested the video camera on a flat, dry space by the birthing table. He took the 20-inch long purple thing into his hands. How do you hold it? All the while, the creature squirming and howling. His son really had looked kind of freaky, too, if you thought about it. Not so. He had this solid living weight, and I loved him right from the start. But what Josh actually meant was, had I loved him right from the start? His newborn son was the one person Josh had ever met without feeling an instant connection to. No, no, no. Josh punched at the radio. Turn that goddamn thing off. Why think that? He wanted so desperately to be at that hospital already. He didn't want to have to get there. White tall St. Joseph's Medical Center, like a fort, had a windowless face and held the top of a smooth, mowed hill. He was so close now. Josh had trapped at the red light across the street. He thought, My son is in that building. It seemed to be an hour just to gather, the, just to gather air th in through a nostril, feel it curl and unwind through his lungs, and then to let it out, all with his eye in that fixed red circle. Josh would have given his house, his car, screw it, his own health, not that it had ever come to that probably, to have this be a misunderstanding and overreaction. Didn't the accuracy part of Dory exaggerate sometimes? The baby wouldn't have had to be perfect, mind you, just alive and minimally damaged. Not brain damaged, though. The typical American secular Jew approach, backing into prayer. Not that his devotion's antique alphabet was anything but gibberish to him. But Josh's inner voice begged with his idea of God anyway, a sort of wily old Midwesterner with a kringle beard. In this negotiation, he could tell the old campaigner saw through him. What did Josh really have to offer? And so he found himself repeating, please, over and over. Please, please, please. Great, uh, green light. Then the ridiculousness of trying to find a parking spot when your kid might be dead. A black hulking Range Rover, swaggering into the last available spot, nearly crushed Josh's bumper. He hurled curses, orbited the lot again, then raced to the red, to the red cross hatching of a no parking zone. Then he was out in the rain again, his headlights on, screw the beeping, and sprinting to the glass door whose sliding open would allow him, at last, to apply his confidence to this disaster. Okie dokie, let me just check, the admitting nurse said. She'd been on her headset phone before she'd noticed Josh. Goldman, you said? Golden. A salesperson is a salesman is a professional noticer. The nurse wouldn't look him in the face, probably embarrassed by the rings under her eyes, which were brown, like where napkins have been stung by the coffee cup. Even now, Josh felt tuned in, awake to the human cues. And getting this woman to like him seemed the first step toward assuring Zach's health. The baby's eight months, he said. Zach Golden. His voice broke when it touched the familiar name. Oops, the nurse said. The Far Corner TV ran a sitcom at mid-volume. Everybody loves Raymond. Sorry, 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 said the nurse. She squinted her eyes to slits of inattention. Josh even wondered if there might be a friend still connected to her through the earpiece. Nurses who lack feeling must do it either... Must do it for two reasons. Either they have an Epicurean's taste for blistering arguments, or they've got so much compassion it's a risk to reveal any at all. Then again, only a saint would reflect, hey, this is life or death for every patient, every time. Josh was leaning on the desk, under Josh's elbow, some waiting room detritus, a New York Post back, back page up, Boston Rise, Sinks, Yanks. He was kind of wet from the rain. His elbow print was a gray continent across the photo of Kurt Schilling. It was amazing how distinct, how spotlit everything in the hospital was. Here we go, Mr. Golden, the nurse said. Isaac, aged 35 weeks. Then her face had a nervous moment. I'll have to let you talk to the attending, okay? I'm sending an am upstairs. A lot of suspicious overblinking. Josh rummaged through his jacket pocket. His shirt was sticking to his chest in, spl in splatty flaps. Oh, sir, I'm sorry. We don't allow cell phones in the hospital. They'll be with you shortly, okay? I sent an IM. She was already back to tapping at the computer, as if she didn't know he was asking about his son. Was this for show? He dialed anyway, and throughout the dialing, he had this thought. Four months. Sir, the machines are very sensitive if you use your cell phone. It's a rule for a reason. Josh's eyes went violent. I'm trying to find out what's wrong with my son. I'm calling my wife. Do you want a scene here? Josh taking a stand, feeling as if he was at least doing something. Because I'll make a scene. And it was pointless anyway. Hi, I've reached Dory's cell phone. 
The hospital kept humming all around. Many times when Josh sat at his desk alone at work or chatted with an EVP or joked his way through a business lunch at some American fusion restaurant, any time he happened to find himself without his wife, he had a strange thought. He almost believed that Dory was at his side, a dark knockout with a high old-fashioned forehead. For Josh, marriage was companionship that never stopped, but he felt entirely by himself in this emergency room, 100% alone. Four months, could that be? That was when Zach had first smiled, had first seemed actually to recognize his father. Josh hadn't felt genuine love for his son right away. He had to admit it. It had taken months. Dory appeared in front of the elevator, searching for Josh, standing in her queenly way, a frown tugging her soft, uh, her soft uh, pale lips. Even now, her particular beauty was the thing you noticed first. The sly width of her temples, the vivid throat, the mouth whose fleshier bottom lip obtruded like a drawer left halfway open. Her skin took even this unflattering hospital light and did something dulcet with it. Josh met her face across the waiting area. Honey. And reached her in what seemed two floorless strides. From the television came recorded applause as if endorsing his hopefulness. She was wearing his old Reggie Jackson t-shirt. Right away he came out with the panicky, high-pitched inevitables. She just took him into a hug. He had the soft of her body at least. No, it's not good news, Dory said. Somehow it was the girlish voice he'd heard each day for the past eight years, in bed, at parties, and over morning coffee, in the cars they'd owned, on airplanes, a voice that so often delighted in the sunlight and in the dark, a voice that signified to him the assorted teeming sentiment of family itself, telling him... It's not good news. She went on hugging. He's under observation, we don't know. And her perfume... He'd smelled it just this morning, lifted into his nostrils again. There was sweet familiarity in it. Everything's got to be okay. Thank God you're here. She said. She didn't know a thing about Turkey, or even like to discuss it, but she was part Turkish. And that dissident splash gave, her, gave Dory her proud, uncommon look. She told all that Zach had been fine, just sitting in the baby Bjorn. They'd been in Pathmark, but around noon he just started kind of throwing up. She wouldn't have worried, but there'd been some blood in the throw up. Not much, but any is some. It had been terrifying and awful. By the time they reached the hospital, this doctor had had to push on Zach's chest to get him breathing again. Her voice staggered a bit here, because Zach coded. Jesus Christ, but was the baby going to be okay? This finally was the real terror, the trap door, the abrupt fall. Well, thank God he's breathing normally now, which is great, Dory said without histrionics. But her mouth, dry and pulpy with trembling corners, gave the game away. No, I don't know. I think probably yes. They were actually going to send him home at first, but then he passed out. Thank God, Josh said, with a stringy feeling behind his knees, using all his mental strength just to follow along, thinking, This is allowed to just happen to regular people? Two old ladies walked right at Dory and Josh. They parted around the Goldens and then closed ranks again, crying as they went. This was the thing. Everybody in this emergency room was draped in their own concern. She showed Josh her gallant cheeks. He had an impulse to beg forgiveness. He couldn't think for what, but then realized it was for not having loved Zach quickly enough. There had also been that silly, mostly innocent thing he'd done that time. Dory never knew about it, and wasn't it stupid to think about that thing, that one worthless, worthless, worthless dangling thread on the steadfast embroidery of their marriage, was relevant now? Josh was about to ask Dory to take him to Zach when she said, Let's go there together. Through the corridors of pediatrics, a disheartening smell floated in waves. It was composed of rubbing alcohol, plastic, and very faintly, shit. Dory hurried them past a statue of Big Bird, following a trail of paw tracks that had been painted on the wall. All this nullifying cheerfulness, smiley faces peeping Kilroy style around corners, clouds painted by the light fixtures, was made even weirder because the rooms they passed were beeping. There was no way to soften or disguise the life or death machines. Josh believed he, he could get over it, that is, if, God forbid, it came to that. But how grindingly, obl- obliteratingly sad that there were so many people in the world who would never meet his son. And could she get over it? He wondered. Dory had started crying gently. Her pale eyes had the lit from within color of nighttime swimming pools. A, long fla- a long-faced black woman stood at the entrance of the pediatric intensive care unit. Excuse me. Josh peered over the woman's shoulder. But we're looking for the supervising doctor. You're in luck, then. The woman laughed shyly, and at the same time a bit touchily. She was two women, one of them offended. Dory said, This is Dr. Stokes. Well, that was it, then. This black doctor would think he was racist. Through his body, Josh felt his heart going, felt the thump, the great thump of worry. The doctor would take it out in the baby, maybe not even in an overt way. He wanted to tell the doctor that even if Dory didn't look it, she had some Turkish blood in her, so how racist could he be? 
He didn't trust this doctor's looks. She wore her hair stigmatized straight back. Suddenly, Josh was sure Zach was already dead. They were keeping it from him. Meanwhile, Dr. Stokes moved ahead into a flash flood of confusing talk. Something or other in vomit shows that gut obstruction could be a possible something. Gastric something lavage. AVM, stool guaiac is the most common form of something occult blood test. When Josh pressed closed his eyes, with his thumb and middle finger, it made fireworks in his lids. For this test, the baby would have an NG tube up his nose, then we inject saline, which we suck back up to look for blood. The doctor had a slump forward way of standing, which gave her lanky frame a false impression of weight. Some of her phrases, as they slipped by, did have a familiar, grabbable part or two. And Josh made a collection of words he recognized, checking for tumors, possibly fatal. Hospital was a language Dory spoke. Okay. She said. But all that is highly unlikely, right? She was nodding, willing the doctor, her voice flicking into melancholy competence. Thank God for Dory. Josh always found it kind of a surprise, like a holiday whose calendar location you forgot, to remember things, to remember she knew things he didn't. Dr. Stokes, we really appreciate it. Dory said. She let a gulp of hesitation pass. Still, if Zach's vomit had blood in it, why did no one check his coags? Even surrounded by makeup smudges, her eyes, deeply open now, shed their bright blue. The effect was striking. Wait, Josh said. There was a screw-up? Somebody made a mistake? The doctor's barricades withstood this. She had a, she had a tantrum, tantrum repelling calm. I'll, unca- I'll look into that, Mr. and Mrs. Golden. I can tell you, however, that the ER note reads... Can we see him? Josh said pleasantly, but with some starch in it. Even here, he wouldn't take on the lowercase life of an Alyssa. Please, Dr. Stokes, I'm just his dad. Where's Zach? Honey. Dory quietly took his arm. They're running tests right now, Josh. All of us need to find out what's wrong, okay? Right. Josh felt an uncried cry, wedged in his throat. Of course I understand that. As with everything he'd said the last unthinkable hour, this really meant... Please, I'm just looking for someone to tell me what's going to happen. Dr. Stokes... Dr. Stokes tried to smile at Josh, tried to avoid the condescension that passes between doctors and those who need them. The professional face of physicians and prostitutes, the mouth getting the job done, the eyes belonging to somebody else. The presumption of Dory's... All of us. ...seemed to have annoyed her. Dr. Stokes turned once more to Dory, whom she'd fixed on as the spouse in charge. According to the emergency room note, there had been no symptoms to indicate that someone named Dr. Weiss should have checked coagulation factors. That drab imitation warmth, that stiffness. This is the best try this woman can give us? Josh wondered. I mean, I know what I told that other doctor. Dory said, but right away she drew herself up into a hallowed dignity, a mother guarding her cub. This was beyond the pettiness of who said what. She wristed her cheeks dry. Did the hospital blow it? Josh thought. Is that what happened? I have to find out if that's what happened. Dory brought her hand to Josh's damp face, which was the way he learned that he had started crying too. Dr. Stokes' eyebrows arched politely closer together. I know it's very hard to process right now, she said. This was more hosp- This is more than hospital consolation. It really did seem genuine. It must have been the result of Josh's crying. Men's tears, like any rare and glittering commodity, always gets people's attention. Josh's son hadn't even spoken his first words yet. Dr. Stokes had the edgy, officious person's inclination to keep talking, even after the point had been made. I do understand, really. I'm a parent myself. I have a seven-year-old. Your child is an expert hands, I can promise you. Then she threw a glance at something or someone down the hallway. We'll have more solid information after his liver function tests. Please, but you'll have to excuse me now. An Asian nurse arrived at Josh's elbow, wearing all pink. She told him in a quiet, candied voice that, pardon me, Mom and Dad, it's time to leave the ICU. Let the doctors do what they do best. The nurse's plastic name tag had a teddy bear sticker on it. They were marketing the hospital experience to toddlers. But what good did Josh's noticing do him now? The nurse put her hand on Dory's elbow to move her gently along. They all saw a suburban mom in a Yankee shirt, another minivan, minivan panicker. Only Josh knew how trained his wife was. When Josh leaned in to shake Dr. Stokes' hand goodbye, he realized he was still holding the New York Post he'd first seen in the emergency room. He didn't remember having taken it, but here it was. Boston comeback sinks Yanks. Fear of tragedy prowls in the margin of every decision to get married. In an emergency, companionship becomes essential where it had been only pleasurable, substantial where it had been light. The proverbial comfy old chair has to become a life raft. Everybody will need this someday. Everybody knows it. Whenever she'd come to spark plug get-togethers, Dory had gotten covered by that spouse camouflage thing that happens. She'd blended in with the furniture and other non-office people. Even worse, Josh had always been a prick about visiting Dory at her office. 
But now, as they rode the elevator downstairs, he looked into her confident face and thought, What can I add here? Did the doctors fuck up? Dory spoke fluent hospital. His talent was fluffing people's mental pillows. He got other people to open up, to share surface truths, to bullshit. Five stories under pediatrics. In St. Joe's cafeteria, the wall clock had an advertisement on its face. Norvasic, am- amipiptaline besolate, is the most prescribed brand and anti-hypertensive agent in the world. Mm-hmm. The clock read 7.32 p.m. Josh worked at figuring this whole thing out. The million to one of a sick child, the hospital's fuck up, his maybe sunless future, everything, but it made him tired. He felt numbly dismal. Dory would have to explain it all. She'd gone to the bathroom. Josh purchased two cellophane-wrapped apples, yogurts, a shivering jello, and he waited for her in a padded booth. The Goldens were healthy eaters. Those apples were deviously wrapped. Opening one, he lowered his head in concentration. He always found Dory a booth when he could. She liked them better than regular tables. A shy-mouthed Hispanic kid made his way past with limped, wary steps. He seemed to be to be moving in slow motion. It was a slow motion world down here. People sluggish with contagion, with shitty luck. The kid wore the disbelieving face of misfortune, that sense of a promise broken. In the absence of wood, he was knocking on his head. Everyone with their stratagems, their god wooing, everyone with some kind of rabbit's foot against the worst. Josh, a genius of optimism, had no talent for despair. How could he have? When Josh had been a kid, his own father would lift him to the ceiling and goof. Nothing bad can happen to a superboy. He lived happily. He lived happily. He was coveted and appealing. He entertained, but Josh's, Josh's imagination was limited. It didn't stretch far enough, that rickety bridge, to lead him to the unfamiliar. And yet, sitting in that cafeteria, he pictured Zach's funeral. Shiny brown coffin, yellow bulldozer, sinister hole in the earth. Were there special coffins for babies? He imagined shoveling the dirt himself. Everyone's super quiet. The only noise is the earth scattering on the polished lid and the crying. Josh even guessed how a baby's death might feel, an eternity of never being able to talk. So we'll cut ahead a little bit. There's a lot of uh, waiting. And um, you know, people say the internet has made the world more convenient, but its real effect has been to turn everybody more restless. It's harder to wait when you're used to receiving the world at high-speed connection. You feel all the things. You feel life itself should be quick as desire, immediately searchable. So they're waiting, and they meet a dorky and Jewish-looking doctor named Dr. Weiss. Um, Though Josh had never met him, Dr. Weiss was a totally familiar person to him. The bad posture, the bony nose with its hourglass bridge. Josh had known guys like this at sleepaway camp. Brillo-headed, delicate, body-fatless nerds. Guys who lived socially by the occasional sidelong acquaintanceship with people like Josh. This Dr. Weiss was somebody you'd remember as having worn glasses, even though he hadn't. Anyway, there's another medical monologue that Dory could follow, but that left Josh at the curb. It felt like being in Paris having only kindergarten friendship, but being asked to negotiate a hostage situation. Words like esophageal varices, longitudinal superficial venous, and once in a while the clear words satisfactory and life-threatening, which made Josh's hands damp. But the upside is, the baby seems fine now. All the danger signs have gone. And so Dory, with her medical background, argues that since the baby looks all right now, she and Josh should be allowed to take him home. Because she says the hospital screwed up, she wants her son out of there. She argues with Dr. Weiss, who rubs his eyes, rubbing behind the lenses of those glasses he didn't have. So things get heated. Dory's been uh, basically accused of lying. And uh, so we pick up the story again when Josh finally sees his son, Zach. The baby, Josh had reached the baby. The baby lay squirming in a little elevated bed. He was attached to seven inconceivable wires and tubes, yellow, black, too see-through. The baby's face was pale and drenched in sweat. There were blue patches under his open blue eyes. Why are you doing this to me? Is this the way things are on this planet of yours? Said the baby's sleepy, trustful expression. They all followed the baby down two floors to gastroenterology. And after some new doctors put out their hands to shake, Josh and Dory watched in the new green and oatmeal colored GI lab, St. Joe's latest pride, as the anesthesiologist hooked Zach up to an IV. Then the gastro guy wedged what looked like the ruffled hose of a vacuum cleaner into the baby's mouth through which, once he induced Zach to swallow the end of a camera-tipped wire, he snaked that internal peeping machine down the tiny unconscious throat to the pharynx, the esophagus, stomach, and finally to the duodenum, the opening of a small intestine. Next, the golden son, the video monitor, what no parents in any generation before this one had seen, their child's alimentary canal in full color, pink, gaping, and round. It stared at them, an angry, bloodshot alien eye, but it was easier for Josh to watch unreal raw pictures on the screen than to look up and see what was happening to his son 10 yards away. 
Zach in his little diaper was so outrageously vulnerable on the operating table, so small and dead-seeming there under a light fixture that looked like a glowing UFO bottom. The baby had a sheet over his naked chest, and of course that tube in his mouth. How do you not gag? While the gastro guy and the anesthesiologist bent over him, each man pale like so many of the hospital workers here, pale in a good facsimile of the, of the leaden skin of grief. A scowl bunched up Dory's face. She marched toward her son. After an uncertain second, Josh followed. The nurse had moved Zach onto a wheeled stretcher, and Dory said, I'll take my baby now. Thank you. The nurse gave way to her. The inherent rights of motherhood were the incalculable element here. And Dory bent to pick up her son, the tendons of her longish neck flaring, roots seeable under the skin. As she leaned over the stretcher, though, she must have worried that someone might stop her. She shot up straight, a volatile flush on her cheeks. For a moment, she and Dr. Weiss stood face to face on either end of the stretcher, formerly like two soldiers. Dr. Weiss seemed to waver. Maybe he should just take up the baby himself. And this led to a certain amount of his leaning and straightening, jerkily, like an American executive foaming through his first business meeting in Japan. Josh arrived at the scrum around his baby, just as Dory scooped the small body into her arms. Zach looked miraculously, beautifully like himself, a baby of eight months, perfectly healthy. Guess what? Dory said. Her brooding face had gone. The eyes flashed. Guess what I'm doing. She moved between the hospital people. When everyone drew back, it was just Dr. Stokes who stood in Dory's path. Precautions must be taken, Dr. Stokes said, grinding the knuckle of her impatience into the words. We'd like to have the baby under observation. We'd prefer, of course, to have parental consent. I bet you would. And just like that, it was over. Josh in the parking lot again, as if nothing at all had happened, the only difference being that it wasn't drizzling. It was night, and the crookback lamps now gave out their yellowish stares. The nighttime humidity added to some, the summer's whole aura of being lazily pleasant. Ten hours in that fort-like hospital. Maybe sick people needed a fort to feel they can battle death. They started the ride home in silence, Dory's hand on Josh's knee. He kept peeking in the rearview mirror at his son. He had a split-second mental picture of the alimentary canal, the red glaring eye inside Zach's chest. He shook his head and the image was gone. Long Island on the map looks like a tailless crocodile with its mouth open. The island's far shore divides into a pair of long, narrow mandibles. Yawning Peninsula is 100 miles east of New York City. Meanwhile, the crocodile's hind end asses right up against Manhattan. A quarter of the distance west on the crocodile's cragged back sits Glenwood Landing, the patch of low, flat, anesthetized swampland where the Goldens lived. They made it about a mile uphill, downhill into town. Then the rear view pulsated red and white with the one-two hysterics of a police car's lights. After that, the siren. They wanted him to pull over. Thanks. So that's it, really. The only thing I'll, I'll say, thanks for your help, is that um, this is a story about Munchausen by proxy in, in large part. And so it's about um, the mother being accused of harming the baby on purpose. Um, and it's a it's a more common disease than people know about it. Actually, I'm writing an op-ed for the Times about it because there's law, a law now in the that's being floated in the New York State legislature to make it harder for the hospitals, hospitals to take babies away from their kids. So this is about whether or not she's hurting her kid, and it's about how you never really know your spouse fully. So um, the, it's the husband doesn't know at, throughout the entire book whether his wife's doing it. We find out a third of the way through the, whether she is or not. I won't spoil it for you, but um, um, so that's what it's about. It comes out today. And um, like I said, I'm doing, oh, it's gone. I'm doing a blog about it, about my book tour for Newsweek, and there's my, uh, my dad's mix on my computer. Um, and uh, that's it. Any, anyone have any questions? Well, they, thanks. Yeah, there's um, there's a part that happens later in the book at the upfronts, which is where the um, the uh, TV stations try to sell um, their shows to um, to ad buyers. And so, actually, I sneaked into MTV's um, upfront presentation, and it's kind of crazy. I don't know if you guys have ever been to an upfront, but um, at this one thing, which was just for just for business executives, a pretty small crowd. Kanye West played, Jamie Foxx was there, John Stewart was there, Stephen Colbert, The Who. So it was kind of insane. It's this sort of like Woodstock event with all these great acts that no one knows about except for the people in the industry. So I wrote about that, and that was, that was kind of fun. But, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I do research for all the books, but I don't do too much because um, 
uh, as I learned when I studied with the ill doctor, he said, do the least amount of research you can get away with because if you do too much, you'll read like a textbook. So tell your story. That's the most important thing. Tell the, the story as entertainingly as possible and use the research to kind of fill in the blanks. Um, so, and the other thing is I was on the, uh, I was on the um, late show with uh, Craig Ferguson yesterday, so I'm pretty tired because uh, I flew back in. So I'm sorry if this is a little bit low energy, but um, that was kind of a crazy experience because um, I flew six hours to L.A. and then five hours back for a three-minute talk on TV. <laughs> and it was totally worth it also. He was really nice. But also Virginia Madsen was there, and so she would not talk to me. She She acted like I was not a guest in the show. So... <laughs> I think she thought I was like a stalker, but a stalker with his own green room. I don't know why that, but um, anyway, so if there's no further questions, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think as a writer, you're always trying to like figure out um, how people interact. And so if you see something interesting, you write it down. Or if you hear an interesting piece of dialogue, you write it down, and you're not really sure where you're going to put it. But I always kind of look for an interesting story. Like um, my first book was about conjoined twins, the first famous Siamese twins, Chang and Ang. And I wrote that when I was in graduate school, because everyone in my grad school at NYU was writing um, autobiographical stories about how their grandmother died, and it was really sad for them. And I said, yeah, that we all sort of know that, but it's not that interesting. So I wanted to do something as, as different from my life as possible because my life had been pretty boring up to that point. So um, I just took this story and wrote about these twins. And then it's funny how you then find things of yourself, I mean, to put in there, because it couldn't have been further from me. You know, they were born in 1811 in Siam, and they're attached. And, um, and yet I think there's a lot of me in that book, so I don't know. But it's kind of funny, too, because... Um, I've had really odd luck with what I've written because I wrote a book about twins and then I had twins uh, seven months ago. And then my twins were um, a month early, so they were in the pediatrics ICU, which is where I just read about. So I, I was reading the proofs to this book in the pediatrics ICU about the pediatrics ICU, and I was thinking, you know, I've got, <laughs> I've got to start writing fun things next, like a guy who wins the lottery and wins the National Book Award in the same day or something. So um, That's my next book. <laughs> it's going to be two pages long. It's going to be really happy. <laughs> so, um, anybody else? Okay, well, thanks everyone for having me, and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.